and everyone. Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we're in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and we resume our study in verse 24. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 24. And uh, we'll begin in a minute. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And I'm glad that you joined me today so we can study the Word of God together. But you can study the entire Bible from Genesis through Revelation, three complete series going through the Bible, verse by verse, at thebibleversebyverse.com. And you can study it in any order that you want, any book that you want, any chapter. Just click it on, click on, the, on the part that you want to study, open your Bible, listen, and follow along as I teach it verse by verse, as we're going to do today. That's at the Bible, verse by verse, dot com. Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 24. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go back and begin reading in verse 18. Then went King David in and sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I? O Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me thus far? And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God. But thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner of man, O Lord God? You, there, nobody like you, God. You've just been so good to me, and David couldn't figure out why. Um just blessing upon blessing. It's just the manner of man. God, you're not like anyone that I know. True. 20. And what can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. Yeah, God, you know I'm not worthy of these things, which just really amazed David even more. Verse 21. For thy word's sake, and according to thine own heart, hast thou done all these great things, to make thy servant know them. God, you're good because you're good. That's the only explanation for God's goodness toward us. He's good because he's good. And if you think that you deserve good from God, then you need to get in the Bible and find out what you really deserve. Because every last one of us deserve physical death and eternal hell because of our sins. So anything above that is a product of God's goodness. Verse 22, Wherefore, Thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself, and to make him a name, and to do for you great things, and awe-inspiring for thy land before thy people, which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt, from the nations, and from their gods. 24. For thou hast confirmed to thyself thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever, and thou, Lord, art to become their God. God became Israel's God. He became Israel's God at Mount Sinai when he gave the law and they accepted it and he made that agreement yes you will be our God we will keep your law and God said I'll be your God and you'll be my people God is not our God until we invite him to be our God oh he's our Lord he's our judge but he is not our God until we invite him to be our God. Until that point, people have a God. They have a God of some sort. But it's not a God that can give them everlasting joy. It's not a God that can give them eternal life. It is not a God that can forgive their sins. It is a false God. It is a God that doesn't exist. 
It is therefore a God that just maybe placates their conscience a little bit, but doesn't do them any good. Verse 25. And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. So David prays back the promise of God. God had just made this promise to him. We saw that last time, and he prays it right back. So he, David takes the word of God that he had just received, and he prays it right back to God. And I can tell you this, that prayer is answered yes. That's the way to pray. You know, prayer isn't primarily to get what we want. Prayer is primarily to find out what God wants, pray it back to him, and see him move on our behalf. And let it come to pass, because what he wants is always what's best for us, too. The purpose of prayer is not primarily to get what we want. It's to find out what God wants and then ask him to do it. And, of course, God could just do it and skip our prayers altogether, but God is honored when we love him enough to pray for what we know pleases him. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with asking for something that you want. There are certain things that God won't give you until you pray for them. The Bible says we have not because we ask not. And then verse 25. And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said, and let thy name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel, and let the house of thy servant David be established before thee. David prays, answer this prayer, God, so that people will know that you are great. Don't you just love David's heart? What a heart for God. David understood that the world revolved around God, not him. So he prays, answer this prayer, God, so that people will know that you are great, so that you will be happy. Before we pray any prayer, it would be good to pray a pre-prayer. Ask God, God, please help me to pray for something that will showcase your greatness. That's a good pre-prayer. That'll bless God all by itself. That'll also draw you closer to him. And so pray, God, show me something to pray that you want, that will honor you. Because God will answer that prayer. Whatever prayer you pray as a result of that, it'll, it, God will answer that prayer. He'll draw you closer to him. He'll say yes. And you'll be blessed. 27, for thou... O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, hast revealed to thy servant, saying, I will build thee in house. Therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. David never would have had the courage to ask God for an everlasting dynasty if God had not mentioned it first. Unless it's God's idea, a prayer request like that would be self-centered and wouldn't have anything to do with glorifying God and would therefore probably not be answered yes. Again, that's why it's such a good idea for you and I to get our ideas for prayers from the written word of God. Verse 28. And now, O Lord God, thou art that God, and thy words are true, and thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servants. James 5.12 teaches that people should not make promises. Don't take oaths. I'm just not talking about taking an oath in a court of law. It's talking about swearing to be telling the truth in your everyday life. Don't make promises. If you're a person, and if you're listening, you're a person. But but promises, 
promises are God's business. You know why? You know why we shouldn't promise? It's because of what James says. You, therefore, who say, tomorrow I will go to such and such a place, and tomorrow I will definitely do this or that. You don't know whether you're going to be alive tomorrow. Your life is just a vapor. That's why we shouldn't make promises. Unconditional promises. You, you, you don't control everything. God can promise because he can control everything to ensure that he will keep his promises. In fact, God watches over his word to perform it. You know, there's one reason that God's word always comes to pass is because he doesn't lie. But another reason that his word always comes to pass is because he's omnipotent. He's got all power. No plan or purpose of his can be thwarted, and he stands by his word to perform it. If God makes a promise in his word, nothing's going to stop it from happening. All the powers of hell can't stop it from happening because he's omnipotent, and he will stand by his word to perform it. When God makes you a promise, you can stand on it because not one word Jesus said that is spoken from God will fall to the ground. Verse 29, therefore, now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord God, hast spoken it. And with thy blessing, let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. When God speaks, like I said, it happens because God's word does not return to him void. Look at creation week. God said, let, God said, let there be light, and there was light. When God speaks, it happens. Let the dry land appear, the dry land appear. Let birds, fowls, fish all appear. Bang, just like that, instantaneously. Oh, the sky was filled with birds. And the oceans and the streams and the lakes were filled with fish and all sorts of other creatures. Because God's word does not come back to him void. Stand on God's word. That's why I teach it verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. That's why I will continue to do it for as long as God allows it. And that's why you and I need to study it and build our life on it. I said it. It's the most important thing on earth. You better believe it. Chapter 8. And after this, it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them. And David took meth Methagam, Methagim, excuse me, Methagam Ma, out of the hand of the Philistines. Well, it took a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of years. But David finally defeated the Israelites' arch enemies, one of them, the Philistines. He beat them until they were under his control. The nation Israel now controls the Philistines. Completely turned the table on the way it used to be. It took time. It took a lot of work. It took some bloodshed. It took some heartache. And it took some failure. But it happened. Someone says, well, you know, if, it's, if something is God's will, everything just so easily falls into place. I had a pastor tell me that one time. You know, if something is God's will, it, it's just all smooth and, and easy and happy. And I said to him, where did you get that? Because you didn't get that out of the Bible. What are you talking about? And how did you get into that position? If it's God's will, everything is just so easy and smooth. Tell that to a Christian cowboy. He gets thrown off his horse 20 times before he finally breaks it. Tell that to a woman who prays 20 years for her husband to get saved before it finally happens. Don't talk so foolish. Get your nose in the Word of God and out of the TV or wherever else you got it stuck 
and you won't say such foolish things. Verse 2, And he smote Moab, and measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground. Even with two lines measured he to put to death, and with one full line to keep alive. And so the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts. Boy, things are going good now. David conquered the Philistines. Now David conquered Moab. And he put two out of three of them to death. You know, while, while David was running from Saul all those years, he put his parents and his brothers and his sisters down in Moab for safekeeping. And according to Jewish writings, the Moabites killed David's family. And that's why he did this. How foolish it is to be mean to those who put trust in you. How foolish it is to be mean, mean to someone who has been kind to you. That's a, real good, that's a real good way to lose a friend and to make an enemy. Verse 3. David smote also Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to recover his border at the river Euphrates. And David took from him a thousand chariots and seven hundred horsemen and twenty thousand footmen. And notice this. And David hamstrung all the chariot horses but reserved of them for an hundred chariots. Reserved of them for a hundred chariots. Now, this is another big victory for David. Huge. And just notice, again, that after conquering these people and taking their chariots and their chariot horses, I mean, these things were valuable. They were the latest weapons of that day. I mean, they were sophisticated. I mean, you're not talking about spears and bows here. And then notice, though, that David cut a tendon in the leg of all but 100 of the enemy's horses. He cut the, he, he hamstrung them. You know what that Resulted in? That made those horses, very valuable horses, pulling chariots, skilled. That made them useless for the soldiers. See, why would David do something like that? Because he loved God and he knew the word of God. And David did that because years earlier, God made a rule in Israel. No king should multiply horses for himself. That's because God knew that a king might start trusting in a well-equipped army for security rather than God himself. David thinks, I'm not going to take a chance of that happening to me. So he makes these horses useless for battle. I suppose they can pull a plow, but that's about it. Give them a job down at the fair giving kitty rides. That's about it. So he purposely disabled all these horses so that he would not even be tempted to trust in a strong army rather than in God. And that's exactly what God told Israel that their king needed to do. First king didn't do that. David did. It's nice to have a lot. It's nice to have an abundance. But not many, not many Christians can handle it. It's nice to have a lot. It's nice to have an abundance. But it's also dangerous because it's easier to start trusting in that a lot for security. Verse 5. And when the Syrians of Damascus came to aid Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David slew of the Syrians two and twenty thousand men. David was beating the king of Zobah when all of a sudden they got help from Damascus. 
But David was quick to make adjustments and defeated the troops from Damascus as well. Verse 6. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David and brought gifts. And the Lord preserved David wherever he went. Boy, he's just being, he's being blessed going in and coming out. He's being blessed in the country. He's being blessed in the city. He's being blessed on the battlefield. He's being blessed financially. He's just being blessed. David is firing on all cylinders, thanks to God Almighty. It seemed like everything that David touched turned to gold. Everything that he touched turned to success. And we see from this that God is in the business. He's in the process of enlarging the borders of Israel. He's giving, he's giving Israel the land that he promised their ancestor Abraham centuries earlier. It's coming to pass right before David's eyes. Why? Because David is putting God first. See, if you want the fullness of God's blessing, whatever he wants to give you for this life and for eternity, of course, if you want the fullness of God's blessing, if you want the abundant life, and I'm not talking about a million dollars in the bank. God doesn't promise that. I'm just talking about the fullness of joy, the fullness of peace, the fullness of blessings, whatever kind of blessings God wants to give you. It starts by you being holy. God does not bless rebellion. If you're going to rebel, forget it. It's not going to happen. But David is firing on all cylinders. Verse 7. And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. And from Beda and from Birothai, cities of Hadadezer, king, king David, took very much bronze. When Toy, verse 9, king of Hamath, heard that David had smitten all the hosts of Hadadezer, then Toy sent Joram, his son, unto king David to greet him and to bless him because he had fought against Hadadezer and smitten him for Hadadezer had wars with wars with toy and Joram fought with him brought with him I'm sorry vessels of silver and vessels of gold and vessels of bronze verse 11 which also King David did dedicate unto the Lord with the silver and the gold that he had dedicated of all nations which he subdued of Syria and of Moab and of the children of Ammon and of the Philistines and of Amalek and of the spoil of Hadadezer son of Rehob, king of Zoab. So all the valuables that David collected in his victories went to the Lord. He, didn't, he did not enrich himself. It all went to God. It's just like with the horses that he hamstrung. David recognizes that his material possessions are not the source of his blessing but rather that God is. God is the one who gives all good things. He's the source of our blessings. David knew that. So David's devotion is to the blesser, not to the blessing. If he, if he shows devotion to the blesser, God Almighty, the blessings will come. If you start showing devotion to the blessings and he starts forgetting about God, then that's the first step toward trouble. And it's the same with us today. Every good and perfect thing that we have comes from God. God is the one, the Bible says, who so richly provides everything that we need. So you keep your focus on Him, not on the blessings, not even on the human elements of the blessings. Verse 13, And David got him a name when he returned from smiting of the Syrians in the Valley of Salt, being 18,000 men. Verse 14, and he put garrisons in Edom throughout all Edom, put he garrisons, and all they of Edom became David's servants, and the Lord preserved David wherever he went. David's purpose, again, was not to enrich himself, which is why he gave God all the wealth, all the spoils of war, and David's purpose was not to make a name for himself either. 
His purpose was not to make a name for himself, but he became famous anyway. He didn't ask for it. That wasn't his goal. He didn't try to become a celebrity. He didn't, become, he didn't try to become a so-called Christian rock star, singing sensation. If God allows you to have success, that's fine. Having fame is not a sin. Seeking fame as a Christian is a sin. Especially if you're going to tag the word Christian on whatever it is you do. Christian recording star. Can it? Christian recording star. If you're going to put the name Jesus or the name Christian in something, it better not be about you. And you better not be drawing attention to yourself. And you better not word, use the word star. As it applies to you. You are taking something holy. The name of Jesus. And you are using it to promote self. And that goes for preachers who do the same garbage. How dare you. Use the name Christian to promote your business or to promote your career. If you're going to use Christian, then you better not charge for anything because Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. If you're going to do something in the name of Jesus, then you better give it away and trust him to provide. David's purpose was not, a, not to make a name for himself. He just became famous anyway. God allowed it. Fine. Fame is not a sin. Seeking fame is. Success is not a sin. Seeking success is. Especially if you're using the name Christian. No, it's, it's not wrong to be a, seek success as a business person. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about within the context of the Christian subculture. But our focus is not to be on ourself. We shouldn't be seeking great things for ourselves. We should not. And I know that flies in the face of the world as it is, but it's true. In Jeremiah 45, 5, God says, Should you then seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. You seek to honor God. Do the best job that you can for the glory of God. And let him determine the blessings that come upon you. We are to have a God focus, not a self focus. If fame comes, if success comes, accept it as a gift from God, but have a God focus. Seek to honor him. 15. Uh, yeah, let's do it. And David reigned over all Israel, and David executed justice and righteousness unto all his people. This is, this is a godly leader right here. David did what was right for all the people. David did not have one set of standards for one person and another set of standards for another person. That sort of favoritism goes against Scripture. Verse 16. And Joab, the son of Zariah, was over the host. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilu, Ahilud, was recorder. And Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were the priests. And Sariah was the scribe. And Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, was over both the Cherethites and the Pelethites. And David's sons were chief rulers. So... These verses describe the king's cabinet, as it were. No question about it. Some form of bureaucracy is needed when you have a country to operate. Organization and delegating are biblical ideas. There needs to be a leader, someone who is accountable to God, someone who in, superintends all things and is accountable to God, 
but it's not scriptural for one person to try to micromanage everything themselves, especially in a big operation like this. Boy, I'm out of time. Got to stop. You can continue studying the Word of God if you want at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. As I said at the beginning of the broadcast, just click the book you want to study, the chapter, open your Bible, listen, follow along as I teach it verse by verse. That's at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Please remember we're brought to you by your prayers and your financial support. You can give in a secure method at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Just click the donate button at the top of the front page and give as the Lord may lead or write scripture verse by verse. Post Office Box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074. Scripture verse by verse, Post Post Office Box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074. One more time, the web address for that website is thebibleversebyverse.com. Make sure you go there and start studying the Word of God, okay? It'll bless you. It's the Word of God, thebibleversebyverse.com. Till next time, so long, everyone.